Hi, everybody. Um, this video is going to be about what you can expect on the first exam. Um, I'm going to take you through the different types of questions, maybe give you some examples that could be very useful. And um, I'll try to do this quickly. But you know me, still the same old G. The, um, okay, arguments and non-arguments. So the first uh, few questions will be, you'll have to identify arguments from non-arguments. So remember that, um, so there's a section that we went over that lists off the different types of non-arguments. So explanatory passages, um, narratives can some, in a, in a lot of cases, um, are not arguments. Uh, uh, explanations of things are not arguments. And so uh, remember that an argument has a debatable conclusion, and it also has premises that support a position on that debatable conclusion. And so if somebody's telling you uh, why an airplane crashed, for example, um, and they know why it crashed because they found the black box and they did a bunch of met, you know, uh, analysis, that would be more of an explanation. The plane crashed because the second engine went into failure. This then led to this, this led to that, and then ultimately the, the plane crashed. Um, but an argument, again, is about a debatable topic. Now, there, it, explanations can be confusing because sometimes the explanation is not correct, right? Which can lead to an argument, right? Um, so, for example, like, you know, who shot John F. Kennedy, there are different types of explanations for that, but it's still a debatable um, premise or question, so people create arguments about it. Um, that, that's pretty easy overall, I think. Um, these will be, these are the more simple questions I, I try to ease in uh, on, the, on the exam. Next is inductive versus deductive arguments. So there's big section. I have videos with a bunch of sample problems where we go through different types of arguments. Remember, deductive arguments attempt to prove their conclusion, they attempt to prove their conclusions beyond a shadow of a doubt. Inductive arguments support conclusions. So whenever you see somebody making an inference that there's a certain case based on a percentage, usually when you see that, it'll be an inductive argument. So 70% of students said that the practical logic class is horrible. Therefore, next semester, at least 70% will say that it's horrible. That would be an inductive argument because it doesn't prove the conclusion necessarily. A lot of times, deductive arguments have, um, have a very strict form. And we'll talk about those forms later on in the class. Um, but, um, for example, there's one called hypothetical syllogism. So like if A, then B, if B, then C, therefore conclusion, if A, then C, um, if I walk five miles a day, then I will become healthier. If I become healthier, then I'll become happier. Therefore, if I walk five, five miles a day, I will become happier. That is a deductive argument. You might have deductive arguments that do have, um, percentages in them, but they would have a very similar form to that. If 70% of students like my class, then I'll feel good about myself. 70% of my students like my class, therefore, I feel good about myself. That is actually a deductive argument, even though it, it contains percentages. Um, and so you can see how these things can be a little bit slippery and a little bit confusing. Um, anytime somebody Okay, sorry, not any time. In almost all instances where somebody appeals to an authority, um, it would be an inductive argument, especially in a very complex, um, in relation to a very complex problem. So, and I'm not being partisan here, this is actually true. Donald Trump says that uh, immigrants are one of the major banes on society. Um, uh, therefore, we should build a wall, right? Um, 
that's actually an argument that's going on right now. It's inductive, right? And it's appealing to Donald Trump as, as the authority. And then he might be appealing to other authorities on the topic. But uh, it would be an inductive argument. Or uh, a better one, an easier one would be like, um, let's say that the, um, um, a high ranking professor at some great school um, uh, says that the economic impact of immigration is actually more positive for uh, undocumented immigrant groups uh, and and thus we should um, we should actually support undocumented workers coming over because the overall economic impact is actually more positive than the negative impact um, to certain people. Again, inductive argument. So we're 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 relying on a, a person or a group or expertise, and then we're making drawing a conclusion from that. It doesn't necessarily prove that our outcome is going to be correct. It doesn't necessarily prove that we have the right belief. But in a lot of instances, we have to rely on experts, and it's, it's a fairly strong way to reason. Um, and it's something we should all remember when we want to believe things that aren't backed by evidence or that seem really zany. Um, pretty easy to, to uh, find people out there who've spent their entire lives studying these things in an appropriate fashion. That's an important ca caveat. Um, you need to do it in using a methodology that's relevant, like the scientific method. Um, I have a crazy uncle who studied random stuff for a really long time, but he just keeps reading really bad resources and he creates all of these, these um, crazy scenarios in his head. Just because you study something doesn't mean you're an expert. But if you're using a well-regarded method and you're studying and you're respected by your peers and you've published in articles that are reviewed by other really smart people who've spent their time studying those things, then I'm going to believe you. You know, uh, Dr. Chung, he's amazing. He is my daughter's pediatrician. He's awesome. Um, and I trust, I trust him and he deserves to be trusted. And then I don't have to go to med school and read a bunch of journals to figure out what I need to do with my daughter. I can just go to him. Um, okay. Evaluating inductive and deductive arguments. I told you this video would be short. Um, <clears throat> okay, the evaluation of inductive and deductive reasoning is different, and there are different terms that we use. So it's really important for this test that you know that inductive arguments are evaluated based on how strong or weak they are, and deductive arguments are, based, are, are evaluated on validity and soundness. And if you don't know what those things are, then you need to study more, and I'll give a brief explanation. An inductive argument is strong when it's highly likely that the conclusion is true based on the premises. So if I said 20% um, of Justin's logic class enjoys the class, therefore next semester all the students will enjoy Justin's logic class, what would be, that's a pretty weak inductive argument, right? Because we wouldn't want to draw an inference from 20% to 100 um, if I said 96% of Justin's students historically have enjoyed his logic class, thus next semester, 100% will enjoy the class. It's still unlikely that 100% because there's always going to be one person who's like, I don't like this. How does it relate to what I enjoy? Um, I'm just joking. Uh, but there's always that student, right? Like, um, it's just like, I just have to take this to, for my GPA, blah, blah, blah. I hate it. I hate you. It's like, why do we force students to do these things? It's miserable for the faculty and the student. Anyway, some of you might feel that way. I hope you don't. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, if 96% of my students uh, love my class compared to 20, that's a stronger argument for thinking that future students will enjoy the class. Now, when it comes to deductive arguments, again, those arguments that attempt to prove their conclusions um, beyond a shadow of a doubt or conclusively, the, another way to say, a, so a valid deductive argument is one in which true premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. It does not mean reasoning from um, 
broad categories to uh, smaller categories or from larger groups uh, to smaller or whatever the generic definition online is of deduction and induction. Reasoning from the uh, general to the particular or something like that. Um, in this class, it doesn't mean that because you can re reason from the general to the particular um, using deduction, but you can also reason from the particular to the general using deduction. And for inductive reasoning, it's the same. It's not always reasoning to the larger um, from the particular. So, and I'm gonna try to fool you on the exam. So if you're watching this, you know, you've been warned. I'm gonna try to fool you because I know what you're gonna do is you're gonna like look up what inductive reasoning is and then it's gonna say, it's reasoning from the particular to the general and you're gonna choose that answer and you're gonna be like, yeah, that's what it is. And then it's gonna be brown. And then you're gonna do the same one on the deductive reasoning question, but the opposite way. And it's gonna be wrong because what you should have chosen for induction is um, uh, an argument that attempts to support its conclusion in the strongest way possible. And for deduction, you should have chosen um, the option that a deductive argument is one in which true premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. So another way of saying uh, an invalid argument is one is a, is an argument form in which true premises can have uh, a non-true or a false conclusion. In that case, that's invalid. So we would say an, a deductive argument is invalid when it can have true premises and a false conclusion. And there are a lot of forms of um, invalid reasoning. So for example, if A then B, B therefore A. Um, so if something is a dog, it's a mammal. Um, my cat, uh, or the animal in front of me, the cat in front of me is an animal. Therefore, the cat in front of me is a dog. Um, so, and that's a pretty one, that, that's one that's cut and dry, but, but uh, there are other examples where you might think like, oh yeah, that's, that's good reasoning, but really it's not, it's an invalid form. And then soundness. So soundness relates to deductive arguments because you can have a valid deductive argument form. Um, if it has true premises, then of necessity it has a true conclusion, and thus it is sound. So soundness relates to the truth. In a valid, a valid um, deductive form, if the pre premises are true, then the conclusion is true, thus it would be sound. You can have a deductive argument form that's valid that has false premises and a false conclusion, and that would be unsound. So it would be valid, the form would be valid, but the true value of the premises and the conclusion would have the potential of being false or would be false, and thus it would be um, unsound. So soundness, a sound deductive argument is valid and it has true premises and a true conclusion. An unsound uh, deductive argument can either be invalid, it has an invalid form, or it's, um, it's a valid form, but it has false, at least one false premise. I know it's kind of confusing and just keep thinking about it, keep going over it in the text. Uh, okay, next part of the, uh, that you'll need to know for the exam is um, the counterexample method to prove invalidity. You don't use the counterexample method to prove validity. Um, you use it in an example where the argument is invalid. And what you do is you create sentences that beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, you create an argument with true premises and a false conclusion using the same form. I'm not gonna get into it here because this is, it takes more explanation, but I do have another video, so check it out. Um, in the announcements where I work problems related to the counterexample method to demonstrate invalidity. This is the hardest part of, for most students in the exam. If you're watching this, I'll just tell you, there are three of them. 
intention and extension of terms. So now we're shifting to chapter two. So you're gonna have to order terms by extension and intention. So, okay, how does this work? If you're ordering terms by decreasing extension, that means that we're becoming more precise. So think of like extension is like this, right? If we're decreasing extension, we're bringing it in to the particular. Okay, so the extension of a term that's really broad would be like being. Being, thank you Heidegger, is the broadest term, right? In Aristotle before him. Well, what has less decreasing extension? The universe. Well, anyway, that's debatable, but let's just say the universe has, is, is still really broad, but it's like less extended. What has less extension than the universe? The Milky Way. Uh, so we're, you can see the extension decreasing, then the earth, then me and you, and then, um, well, I should have used some other examples because we're kind of like singularities in a certain sense. Um, but anyway, when we're decreasing extension, you want to go from the very general to the very specific. That's the same as increasing intention. Decreasing extension is the same as increasing intention. Because when you're increasing intention, you're adding more attributes to something to make it more specific. So the intention of the term is all the attributes that you're adding. So let's decrease the extension on a deer. Well, they're white-tailed deer. Oh, that's like a category of the larger genus. But we're also increasing the intention of the term because we've added the white-tail attribute, right? And then there are female white-tailed deer, another attribute. And there are male white-tailed deer. And there are baby white-tailed deer. Um, and so we're increasing the intention while also decreasing the extension. Now, if you're increasing extension, ordering things, then you're going from the specific to the general. It's the same as decreasing intention because what you're doing is you're taking away the attributes and creating bigger categories. So let me say that again. If you're decreasing, um, or sorry, increasing extension, you're decreasing intention because um, you are creating larger categories. So when you decrease extension, think in your head, I need to order these terms from the specific to the most general. All right, we're getting there, we're almost done. The next part's pretty easy <clears throat> um, to get through quickly. The types of definitions, all of chapter two, pretty much. Um, and I'm not, I don't try to like mess around with students and, and fool people. Um, so, uh, let's see. If something is uh, the, the, uh, the dictionary definition, or sounds like a dictionary definition, then it's called the lexical. Um, definition. Um, a persuasive definition, you can think of that as one that's not really trying to define something, it's trying to persuade you into believing something. So the ultimate example, well let's use the immigrant example, right? Um, if you say that an immigrant is someone who's here illegally to take jobs away from citizens, that is a persuasive definition. Um, let's go the other way. So in that case, you're trying to persuade somebody that illegal immigrants are dangerous. But it goes the other way too. Uh, an an uh, undocumented immigrant is someone who is fleeing a horrific life, trying to find comfort in the only place on earth where they can be um, saved, right? That's another rhetorical or, the, uh, sorry, persuasive definition 
that goes the other way, right? Um, theoretical definitions defined, define things in terms of the theory behind them. So electricity is a, is, um, uh, a kind of a swirling projection of electrons that, uh, I don't know the definition of electricity off the top of my head actually, but a stream of electron flow through energy fields or something like that, right? So um, the theoretical definition would be where we're defining the term based on some kind of quantum theory or something behind it. Um, let's see. Uh, a precising definition makes something more precise. So it, um, <clears throat> um, what I mean when I say cup is the white thing that's in my hand. Um, and then, uh, Uh, some others, just quickly, an enumerative definition is one where you say something like, butterflies are things like long-tailed red wings and, and uh, the indigo, the South American indigo, and the, and so you're listing off, in an enumerative definition, you're listing off specific examples as, as, um, as the definition. A president of the United States is someone like Abraham Lincoln or Theodore Roosevelt or um, uh, Bill Clinton, let's say. So that would be an enumerative definition. But uh, yeah, so you just need to be ready for the different types of definitions and be able to identify them. There are like six of those questions. <laughs> Next, identifying premises and conclusions and arguments. That's pretty self-explanatory. I'm gonna give you um, an argument and you'll either have to identify both premises and conclusion or you'll have to um, identify like just the conclusion or just a premise or something like that. Usually students do really well on those. And then finally, questions related to course content readings and themes. So at the end of every chapter, and sometimes in the sections, in the chapters, they have like basically true and false questions or questions around, you know, fill in the blank and stuff like that. These will all be multiple choice, but um, so for example, I might ask you something like, which of the following is a premise indicator word? Or I might ask you, an invalid argument is one in which, and then it would fill in the blanks. Or I might say, all sound deductive arguments have what? And then there would be some options. And the answer to that one actually is true premises and a true conclusion. Um, So there will be some questions around, and I'm not like gonna try to get really nitpicky. I'm more interested in the big themes of this class, argumentation, validity, soundness, strength and weakness in inductive arguments, inductive deductive. I'm not gonna say, you know, find something on page 17, one sentence that, you know, um, to try to prove a point or something like that. I just want to, I, yeah, I just want you to know, um, uh, sorry, I, I want you to know the general stuff. That's what I care about. I want you to be able to walk away from this class and, and someday when somebody says, what did you learn? And you'll say, well, I still don't know what validity is. <laughs> it's so hard, right? You know, it's hard. You're doing it. Oh man, not to be too whatever about it, but man, I was teaching a, one of these sections and I just would ask the class like every time I taught it, three times a week, what is validity? <laughs> and people were just like, 
what? <laughs> it's when it's true. No, no, it's not when it's true. I mean, sometimes it's true. Um, but you're better than that. I'll tell you that I'm not going to ask any questions about the Holocaust readings and things that we did. I don't think that that's in good taste. Um, I have very limited questions on the Marcus Aurelius reading. And again, I'm more interested in common themes. So as you read Marcus Aurelius, think about what is the whole point of what he's trying to do? What is he telling us as a reader how we should live our lives? I'm not going to ask you like, what word did Aurelius use to describe his mother? Although I would love it if you knew the answer to that. Um, and then I have, I've never done this before, but I'm going to, this is going to be like anybody who gets an, gives an answer gets most of the points or all the points. The final question I have, and I'd just like you to write a little bit, is how have you grown your mind in this course? What have you learned? And how have you applied what you have learned to your life? And that's just one for me, really. I want you to reflect on what you've been learning. And I want to see what you're thinking about the class. And I want to challenge you to try to think about how this stuff relates to your own life. So that's exam one. You're going to do great. Keep studying. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions you have. And um, I look forward to seeing, to seeing you do well.